No problem. Yes. So first of all, ooh, that's kind of loud, sorry. Welcome everyone. Um, first of all, I have to tell you that we are filming tonight. They are, have a new audio visual thing in here and they wanted to record this to put on the Louisville City Channel to run. Um, so we are recording, so I apologize if that bothers anybody. I just want to let you know right now, just keep looking at me if you don't want to see the camera. I think it's that one right there. That's what I know. <laughs> So, so that's why we have the microphone tonight. And also, Bethany has a microphone. If you have questions, um, they would like to have the mic so they can hear them on there and stuff. Um, so tonight's workshop is Basics of Backyard Composting. It is brought to you by uh, Boulder County's Resource Conservation Division. That's the same uh, Boulder County Division that owns the recycling center that's in Boulder, where all your recyclables in Boulder County go. Um, and they also are charged with waste reduction in Boulder County, and this is one of the ways they do that, so these free workshops. Um, this is Bethany. She works at the county. My name is Melanie. I'll be your main speaker tonight. However, I don't work at the county. I'm a regular person just like you. I work at a church in downtown Boulder. I'm a full-time administrator there, but I have been doing the compost education like this in Boulder County for the last, we're working on 16 years now. So we are going to talk about real stuff that works here in Boulder County based upon experience. And it's gonna be different than what you have maybe read on the internet, what you heard from somebody else. If you've composted in other parts of the country, we will talk about what works here, what doesn't work here, what things you could do other places that you can't do here and things like that. So we will try to address all of that. And I'm also a very interactive kind of teacher. So I will um, ask questions. I'll want you to you know, respond with answers. And also, I will try to address all your individual questions with only six of you, and we might be expecting a couple more yet, but we should be able to get to all your questions with no problem, okay? So let's jump right into it. Um, backyard composting. So what is composting? If we look this up in a dictionary or on Wikipedia, what would it say? What is composting? Any thoughts? Just shout something out. You don't have to use the mic. Go ahead. That's true. Kind of waste. Correct. Is that decomposing organic material? That's really what composting is. And I mean organic in the true sense of the word, not organic kind of organic. I mean came from a living or once living thing. If you are ever uncertain if something can go into your pile, that should be always the first question you ask yourself. Did this come from a living or a thing? Okay? Organic material. This is the end product we're trying to make. Any ideas? What's a looks like this. This is compost out of my a couple minutes ago. Um, if you want to pass it down, you can smell it, feel it. I recommend tasting it. Um, but it is sweet smelling, um, earthy smelling. It should not smell bad. It should not stink. Your neighbors should not be happy because you're piling up rubbish. Um, it should not be compost this. Now, it kind of looks like dirt. But I don't know about you, but that looks a lot better than all the dirt in my backyard. That's because that's full of organic material. Um, and what we're doing is, is the compost is actually a soil amendment. It is not soil. Soil is really finely broken down rock. It has the structure by being the finely broken down pieces of rock to support the roots so a plant can grow above the ground. But compost is lighter, fluffier, doesn't have that same structure. So if you see something start in your compost pile, like a little sprout of something from a watermelon seed or a pepper seed or something, thank you. Don't worry, that will just compost over into the rest of the pile. It will never get to a full-grown plant because there's a not enough support in that compost to support the roots so the plant can grow, okay? So just realize it is not soil. It is, however, is it fertilizer? What's fertilizer? Anybody know? 
what kind of nutrients? It's usually kind of, it's actually associated with nitrogen. Quick burst of energy for your plants, and that is not what compost is. Compost is a slow release of energy for your plants. So when you put compost in the soil, it will slowly release that material to the plants, feed the plant over the season, over the long term. Whereas in nitrogen, um, a fertilizer, you will see a quick change within a couple of weeks when you put that on a plant. That's because it's like a quick burst of energy for the plant. So think of it as a slow release. So it's not fertilizer, it is not soil, um, but it is um, going to be a soil amendment. This is something we add to the soil. Part of the reason we do this is when a plant grows, you pull those nutrients out of the soil, and we want to get those nutrients back in the soil. So by adding compost into the soil, we put those nutrients back in. We kind of close that loop. Okay, so why do we do this? It's kind of a yucky night. You could be home eating a nice bowl of hot chili and cuddling up under the blanket. Instead, you are out here in the rain with me. Why is this important? Why do we do it? Very good point. So we can reduce our landfill capacity. That is incredibly important. Not only are we saving landfill space, but one of the biggest reasons is, is landfills are designed to keep air and water out. So organic material, that apple core, if we throw it into the, um, into the landfill, it breaks down what we call anaerobically, without oxygen. When we want things to break down aerobically with oxygen, the reason, the biggest reason is things that break down anaerobically give off methane gas, one of the biggest greenhouse gases. So we want to reduce what kind of organic material we're sending to the landfill, because whatever we send is going to break down that way. In addition, like we were saying, we want to return those nutrients to the soil. When that plant grows, there's still value in that apple core. There's value in those green leaves and plants. And if we throw them in the landfill, we lose that value. We don't get that back. But instead, if you put that into your compost pile, use that compost to help grow more things in your garden, you close that loop and you return those nutrients to the soil, okay? Also, does anybody here have compost collection as a part of their trash? You do? A couple of people, great. It's actually very helpful. I do too, and I use it a lot. One of the biggest reasons is there's a lot of things that we can't put in our pile that you can put, that they can handle at a commercial operation that we're not going to be able to handle in our backyard pile. If you're in Boulder County, unincorporated, it's actually part of your trash service if, if you use like Western, but it's a requirement for them to provide, isn't that correct? I'm looking at you because you're the Boulder County expert. But if you're in cities, each city, depending on each city, they sometimes do, and more cities are starting to make it a requirement to offer that as like a third bin option, your trash, your recycling, and your compost, okay? But still, if we have compost collection for everybody, that still requires trucks on the road, burning fossil fuels, it's still not as efficient as you walking across your yard, dropping it in your compost pile, and using that same compost you produced on site in your own garden. So this is still the most effective way, so that's why the county still offers these free workshops. Okay? All right, enough about why, let's get down to how you make it happen. So what does a living thing in Colorado need to survive? Give me your water, big thing here. What else? What does a living thing in Colorado, really anywhere, but in Colorado specifically need to survive? Sunlight. Sunlight. That is true. It doesn't apply for this, but it is true. What else? Food. I heard it. What else? Got to breathe. Air. What else? This is the, always the hardest one. You can't live in Colorado year-round without shelter. Same is true of your compost pile. You need to think of your compost pile as a living thing because it is full of living things. Turn to the second page of your handouts front side. Keep this handy. We are going to go through this in detail tonight. But here's what is happening in your compost pile. These critters, these microorganisms, are the ones who do the work, who actually eat everything you put in your compost pile, and it's their poop that is actually compost. So what we're trying to do is make ideal conditions for them to come and live permanently in your pile. Okay, this is, we're trying to build truly that ultimate field of dreams. And if we build it right, they will come. They live in the top three inches of the soil. You don't have to add them. 
um, with an exception of a, a barrel style compost bin, we'll talk about that. Um, but they occur naturally, they will come in from the bottom. So here's how this works. Look in the center of your uh, picture there, organic residue. This is the stuff we add into our compost pile, stuff we feed our compost. Its presence is what attracts the first level guys. Notice who that is, bacteria, fungus, mold. This is single celled organisms. They come, munch on what is there, and their presence is what attracts these second level guys. Millipedes, earthworms, they eat some of the organic residue and some of these lower level guys, the fungus, the mold, and poop. Their presence is what attracts the third level guys who come, finish eating more of this organic residue, eat some of these lower level guys, and poop. That is what we're going for. That's why it all looks like you can't tell what was in it. That's how compost should look. You can't tell if there are banana peels, leaves, you know, broccoli stems, whatever in there. That's because these guys have eaten it and pooped. That's what we're going for, okay? So everything we do tonight is based upon making these guys the ideal conditions, okay? So what do you think you can feed these guys? What do you think you can feed your compost pile? If you could um, just go ahead and shout out any of your ideas of what you think you can feed your compost pile, what you can put in. Leaves. Leaves, okay. What kind of leaves? Like dead leaves. leaves, like dried leaves, like this time of the year, okay? What about the leaves have all greened out, the trees have greened out nicely in the spring, we get a big windstorm and a whole bunch of the green leaves blow down. Can we put those in? Yes, you can. Don't worry, we'll answer those questions, okay? That's why I asked though, okay? What else? Coffee grounds, okay? What else? So let's just say fruit and veggie scraps. What else? Keep going. Animal poops, we're gonna talk about that. I'm gonna hold that out here, because there's a very, that has a lot of issues with it. What else? Newspaper. Newspaper. Obviously, there's a reason I'm writing them in two categories like this. Turn to the second full page, or sorry, third full page of your handout, front side. Everything that goes in your compost pile falls into two categories. We're going to talk about these categories, and then we'll talk about specific things within them first. So the ones on the left on your sheet, browns. This is the stuff that tends to be yard waste, tends to be dead longer, like I said, dead leaves versus the green leaves. Newspaper, it's gonna be the dry stuff, stuff that crackles, crunches when you touch it. Greens, lush, moist, more recently alive, will tend to be brighter in color, will tend to be green, or a bright color like a yellow banana peel versus dried leaves that are all kind of brown and shrivelly. This will tend to be a brown in color, tend to be a green, but color doesn't always mean. Notice coffee grounds are under the green category. Generally greens are food waste, generally browns are yard waste. Browns are sometimes known as carbon, they're higher in carbon. This is the more kind of protein-based energy source for those microorganisms. The greens, also known as nitrogen, this will be the stuff that is the sugar, the sweet for them. The greens is what attracts them to your pile. But a balance of the two is what allows them to stay. So I have about five things you have to get out of tonight. Um, Bethany has done a great job of summarizing some of those on that very first sheet of your handout. But you have to get this out of tonight. And this is something people tend not to do well, but you have to do. You need a 50-50 mix of these two categories by volume at all times in your pile. Now, first of all, notice I'm saying by volume. I'm not saying weight. Think about it. This stuff has more moisture content. It's going to be heavier. It's going to feel heavier. So I'm talking literally guess by handfuls. You come out with your kitchen scraps and you've got a couple handfuls of greens, you wanna have a couple handfuls of browns ready to throw in with this. 
So here's the glorious moment. You might be a small but mighty bunch today. You are the smart ones when it comes to compost. Everybody thinks to start composting in the spring, but what you need is a stash of browns. When are browns available? Only right now. So now is the time to gather yourself a stash of browns because we're gonna generate this predominantly food waste all year long. But we only generate this stuff except for a few things like newspaper or cardboard certain times of the year. So literally start thinking about stashing browns, okay? Next thing, all the stuff you put in your pile has to be one to two inch pieces in size. Yes, I did say as small as one to two inches in size. So that does mean you have to chop everything up, okay? What this is about is this is about surface area. Go back to these guys. Who are the first responders? They are single-celled organisms. When you have a whole banana peel and you just throw it in your bin, there's only so much surface area they can work on. But if you chop it up, suddenly you have exponentially increased the surface area. So they can work on it faster, things will break down faster. But more importantly, in Colorado, you cannot shirk on this because we have wildlife. We need to get all of our food waste past the fresh point as quickly as possible. Because when it's in the fresh state, particularly fruit and veggie scraps, those coffee grounds, eggshells, that is gonna be the stuff that is gonna give off an odor that is going to attract things to your pile you don't want, like mice, squirrels, raccoons, foxes, let alone a bear or a lion, okay? So you really have to stick to this. Now, don't go too far. One to two inches is the right size because it creates some natural forming air pockets between the particles. So don't pulverize everything in your blender. Don't run everything over in your lawn with the lawn mower because that is too much. You want the one to two inch size. So you do want to, while you're preparing things, chop things up to that size. You're making a salad, you pull out the center of your pepper, you want to give that a few extra chops on the cutting board right then and there before you put it in your little kitchen pail. Don't tell yourself later that you're gonna do it because you won't do it, okay? So do it while it's at that point, okay? Now, that being said, I'm a realist. I know one of my browns right now is some large dead tomato plants, six <laughs> feet tall. Are you gonna sit there and cut every little one up into one or two inch pieces? Probably not, but the more you do that, the better things are gonna break down. So, you know, do what's reasonable. And realize you can shirk a little bit when it comes to browns, but you gotta do the one to two inches with the greens. That's the really critical place, okay? But you know, do the best you can, okay? All right, the other thing that you need to know about these two categories is that you want your pile to have a balanced diet. By this I mean a variety of greens, and a variety of browns ideally. Now in the categories you have there, there's some samples of things there. So I mean ideally a variety of things. Carrots are good for me, but if all I ate was carrots, I'd be sick. Same is true for your worms in your compost pile. There is only one exception, and that is this right here. I am okay if all browns come from leaves. Think about it, leaves are particularly right now abundant, free, and already one to two inches in size. No chopping required. So literally now is the time. It is raining today and I would not recommend doing it today, but Saturday and Sunday is supposed to be gorgeous. I've got lots of leaves in my yard right now from all this rain, rake yours up. I literally put them in black trash bags that are sitting right next to my compost pile. I, um, you wanna put them in something that's gonna contain them either an old trash can or, but just a, just a plain plastic trash bag is fine. And go ahead and tie them up, you know, just, you know, it doesn't have to be super tight, but enough that um, it's going to, you know, keep most things out of there. But don't worry, they're gonna start to get a little mucky in there and they're gonna start to break down. Realize things move in one direction. The reason I asked about leaves is because they start off as greens. 
but dead leaves are a brown. But once a brown, always a brown. It doesn't matter if a brown gets wet, it's still a brown. What's happening is the nitrogen is dissipating off into the atmosphere as these things start to become more brown in color. And what's left is the carbon, which is why we consider them more of a carbon. And so as a result, they can't become a green again. So even though that bag of leaves may get wet, it may start breaking down a little bit there, and when you go to put them in your bin, they're a little on the slimy side, still a brown. As far as you're concerned, from a volume standpoint, count it as a brown. Absolutely, I have mine all stored outside. I mean, I do have a pine tree in the corner, and I try to stick them kind of under there, but it's not like it's a problem. Okay? We're going to talk about each one of those. So we're going to go right down that list. Yes? Is there any spices in the end of the that we shouldn't store? Um, yeah, no, there isn't. The only thing I will tell you in my experience is I wouldn't, if you, for some reason, are a major cook and you have lots of spices, um, they don't, the critters don't tend to like those kind of extreme things as much, particularly worms. They're kind of sensitive. So like, particularly in my worm bin, I've put um, herb stems in there before and they get as far away from it as they possibly can. Like even like cilantro, let alone like a mint or um, I've even put onion or garlic and they do not like that. But you know, your normal cooking mixed in with everything else will be fine. But if you are for some reason like have mounds of garlic, just realize you might want to slowly add that in because that could kind of, you might see it just kind of sit there and everybody kind of avoid it, okay? So let's talk about some of the browns and the greens that are on your list because we do need to talk about some of the idiosyncrasies with some of these. So first of all, leaves. I am talking deciduous trees. I am, so that can be maple oak. It also can be cottonwood. I want to dispel that myth right now. You see out there sometimes that people say to not use cottonwood. The issue is that it is alkaline and that the concern is that it'll throw off the pH. I've had people use all cottonwood leaves with no problem. Um, and, and if anything, our soils in Colorado are a little on the acidic side. So it's not really a big deal, but honestly, don't worry about the pH when it comes to your leaves, even though you read that on the internet. Any kind of deciduous is fine. Realize you don't want to substitute pine needles for leaves. Pine needles are acidic. So they will throw off that pH. So a little bit is fine. By that I mean, you know, you're raking up the leaves in your yard and you got some pine trees and there's some needles mixed in fine. But if your house is the local pine tree forest and you have a blanket of pine needles, that is more than your pile can handle. You cannot treat them like you would leaves, okay? Um, also, one of the things you should know with a backyard pile is our piles are going to only get at 60 to 80 degrees in Colorado. That's pretty much our standard. The reason you should know that is because that means there's some things that you don't want to throw in your pile because we aren't going to get to the temperatures to break them down. And one of those is certainly any chemicals. If you maybe don't have any trees, but your neighbor does, but you know they heavily spray their trees, you may want to look for leaves somewhere else because those chemicals are going to transfer in. And you need to think of your backyard pile as what you put into it is going to be what you get out of it. So um, the only way to really make sure some of those chemicals have broken down is to get to higher temperatures that we're not going to get to, more like 150 degrees. And I'll just tell you right now in Colorado, that's nearly impossible to get to, or you might make it partway there for like one day. Commercial operations, however, can handle those kind of things because they have to certify that their temperatures got up to the levels to kill off those kinds of things. So just know anything with chemicals, you probably don't want to put into your pile. Leaves being one of that similarly when we talk about grass, same kind of thing. Okay? Pine cones, it's the same issue as pine needles. It's, it's similarly acidic. You know, again, few is fine. Realize the woodier and denser something is, like a peach pit or a pine cone, they are going to take longer to break down. So think about a banana peel breaking down versus a pine cone. It's going to, banana peel is going to happen a whole lot faster. Um, and so realize you might still see little traces of it left, but when the whole thing is finished, that's fine. Pull those pieces out. You may have to throw them in kind of for a second round of composting before they'll fully break down. But there's no reason you can't put them in as long as we're talking little bits. Would there be a benefit to having ash? So like if you 
pretty much anything burned has burned up its nutrient, nutrient value. And so ash is not something I encourage you to put into your pile. And, and the other concern is ash sometimes can be a little alkaline and then the pH issue and stuff too. So, I mean, you know, you're cleaning out your fireplace once a year and you got this little pile, no problem. But if you're like heating your house, no way. Okay? You, um, commercial bin, they don't ask you not to put ash in for the same reason because there's really not much value. And if you have a volume, it can actually kind of throw things off. So for the same reason. No, I mean, I don't. I, you know, I buy some things organic more than others. And like bananas is one I don't sometimes because I peel versus you're eating the flesh. So um, no, you do not. I mean, and this is where also my compost pile and what I'm comfortable putting in might be different than yours. I don't have anybody in my household who is chemically sensitive, but if you do, you and you try to like watch every, like you don't use a bleached paper towel, you don't do anything like that, you might want to think about that, but honestly, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to put it in. All right, let's talk more about some of these. Um, grass clippings, same issue with the leaves. Um, they start off as a green. They can become a brown, or they will become a brown, I should say. Um, also be careful of the chemicals. Also, similarly, if you've got somebody who, you know, in your neighborhood who pretty much their lawn looks like chem lawn visits once a week, I wouldn't use theirs. Also, I wouldn't use any grass clippings from a golf course. They use a lot of heavy chemicals, which why it looks so beautiful and green, but just realize that's um, one of the reasons you wouldn't want to use that if you can help it. So also, if you're ever looking for extra material at the yard waste drop-offs, um, I would try not to get grass because oftentimes that's brought in from landscape companies and you just never know what's going to be on that. Yes, you can. We'll talk about that. Um, twigs and sticks So and brown garden waste. Um, by garden waste, I mean anything that lived a normal life cycle. If you had a tomato plant that mysteriously died the 1st of July, that plant has some kind of disease. You don't want to put any kind of disease plant for the same issue of that temperature range. We're not going to get high enough to kill off those diseases, and you'll transfer that disease onto your next round. So, um, you know, like I had one tomato plant this year that just died mysteriously. It's not going in my compost bin. Um, so just realize those kind of things. But a commercial place, they can take that again because they will kill that disease off by getting to that high temperature for several consistent days. We will not. Yep. Yes. Yep. All that. That's exactly any kind of weed. Hold that thought. We're going to talk about. Okay. Wood um, twigs and sticks. The woodier, the denser. It's going to take longer. Like I said, wood chips and pieces. So if you've got a little bit of like mulch or something left over, don't do anything that's been chemically treated or anything like painted. You know, some of those nice red mulches. They've got a chemical on it because it looks nice and red. Don't throw any of that kind of stuff in. Straw. Um, try to know what you're putting in your compost pile. Notice under the browns, straws there, but if you look at the bottom of the greens on the right-hand side, hay, they look a lot alike. Know what you're putting in your pile. You might have a well-meaning friend says, oh, I've got some browns for you, and I've got a bale of straw for you, and you're like, but is it hay? Is it straw? How you can generally tell if it still has the weed or the seed head on it, it's generally more the hay. If it doesn't have that on it and truly looks like a straw, like you can see through, then it's a straw, which makes it a brown. So just sometimes it's hard to sometimes tell. Do your best to tell. And your pile will tell you. Generally, the greens is heats up your pile, and the browns cool it down. So if you add a bunch of what you thought was browns, but your pile starts going really hot, it probably means you added greens instead. That another one where that can sometimes happen is if you look under the greens near the bottom, spent hops. If you're a home brewer, know somebody who is, they look like a brown when it's a spent grain, but it's actually green because it's still got a lot of nitrogen in it, okay? So there's some odd ones like that to be aware of. Back under the browns, animal bedding. So you mentioned manure. Are you planning to use manure? Um, well, my, we have a lot of rabbits in the area, not that I'm going to go pick them up and try to get them Okay. That is probably true. Okay, so let's talk about manure. You need to know some things about manure. First of all, manure is a green, but it's kind of an extreme green. I need to tell you kind of a fact to help you understand it, but then I kind of want you to forget this fact, okay? They have measured the perfect ratio of a compost pile. If we could count every atom, the ratio is 30 carbon atoms to one nitrogen, okay? 
plant eater manure, horse manure particularly, is 400 nitrogen to one carbon. So you'd need like 12,000 carbon atoms to offset horse manure. So in general, manure is a problem, okay? If you want to use it, there's a couple of rules. It has to be from a plant eater, so rabbits would be fine. Horse, cow, sheep, goat, guinea pig, but that is not a dog, that is not a cat, that is not you. Even if you're a vegetarian, you've had some kind of animal product in your life, and the whole issue is we have different bugs in our guts which will transfer with the feces, and that will then make us sick. It's actually a Boulder County health code that you are not allowed to poop or pee on your own compost pile, just so you know, okay? So, that's your choice. <laughs> but just know that's, that's a code, okay? Now, if you want to use the manure, and generally the rule is the bigger the patty, the higher it is. So like a big horse patty like this is the 400 to one. When we start getting smaller to things like rabbits and stuff, we're talking a lot less of a number. However, what you wanna do is age it. When you age it, it's basically sitting out and what's happening is the nitrogen is dissipating off of it into the air and we're lowering that number down because the ideal ratio is more like 30 to 1 the other way. So that's why we want to get as much of that nitrogen away. Generally, if you smell manure and it still smells like manure, it's still too high in nitrogen to put in your pile. And the reason is, is what that really does is it throws off this. Technically, you could throw it in and just put in like five times the amount of carbon and you'd be okay, but it throws off that kind of ratio stuff. So unless you have to use manure, I generally don't encourage you to because you've got lots of other choices for product and it's a lot easier to manage if you don't, okay? So I'm gonna erase these little things because I don't want you to get confused about that because I want you to remember 50-50 by volume because that's really what you're gonna need, okay? Um, cotton rags, don't think of cotton as came from a living or once living thing, you know, like a t-shirt, but it really is. So you sometimes have to think back to the original source of something, certainly you can put that in, but obviously if you used it to like, you know, mop up some oil in your garage, do not put it in, okay? Um, dryer lint. The fabrics that give off the lint are your natural fabrics, predominantly cotton. So even though it has, you know, if it came off of your blue towel and it's got a little blue in it, that is not a big deal. But if you're that household where somebody is super chemically sensitive, maybe you don't throw that in because probably there's a little trace of dye. But for what little bit it's gonna be, it's not gonna be a big deal, but just know it's another place you can use it. Cardboard and newspaper, those are other sources of browns, but I don't encourage you to use them mostly because we can recycle them. Composting is really ultimate destruction. Like I said, with what we passed around, you have no idea what went into that compost. Actually, the federal government actually takes all the money that they pull out of circulation, shred it into about toothpick-sized pieces, and they actually compost it down in Golden at A1 Organics. So they all, too, consider it um, ultimate destruction. So whereas cardboard, newspaper, we can recycle. We can get another life or two out of that before we maybe end up composting it. So try to recycle what you can and use the things that we don't have other ways to use. That's part of the reason I like leaves because we really don't have any other method to use them, okay? But if you do, a couple things you should know, you have to stick to the same rules. You do have to shred that cardboard up. You do have to tear that newspaper up. Now the only kind of newspaper to use is the newsprint kind, not the shiny glossy ad stuff. The shiny glossy ad stuff has metals in the ink, but all the newsprint has to have soy-based inks by law. So it doesn't matter if it's got color in it or not, um, like the, the um, Colorado Hometown newspaper or whatever they call it now, um, or the Daily Camera, all of those, as long as it's the newsprint, it's porous, it'll soak up water quickly, that's the kind of newspaper to use, okay? Pine needles, like we said, um, only in small amounts. And sawdust is the same thing. It's the small particle size. Think about it. Remember we said one to two inches is the right size and think how compact sawdust is. A little bit, again, is fine. You're doing one little project in your garage on a Saturday. You sweep the little bit in, no big deal. But if you're like making a big, you know, big amount of furniture or this is your career, not going to be able to put all that sawdust in. And sawdust would apply to the same chemical 
That's the other thing. Do you have, and I would only use untreated if you're doing it, correct. So greens, okay? So um, obviously fresh green plant trimmings. And so by that I mean maybe you put some lettuce in in the spring and you thin it out, or you're trimming up your um, house plants if those are still nice and green. But if you know you're like me and the house plant leaves you're trimming are brown and crinkly, they are brown. But if you are trimming off green leaves, they would be a green, okay? Um, and again, remember, nothing diseased or anything like that. Um, lawn clipping, same thing, just be careful of the chemicals. Um, fruit waste and vegetable waste, um, like I said, do it while you're there. Um, and like I said, um, don't forget things like, you know, peach pits, um, peanut shells, any of that denser woody stuff, avocado pit, it is going to break down. It is going to take longer. Also kind of leathery things, kind of like the avocado skin that will probably take a little longer. But I literally, um, I brought it along just so people know, this is what I keep my fruit and veggie scraps in. This is why it looks like this. This literally just sits on the counter. You do not need one of those fancy little kitchen pails to keep your scraps in. I literally just use this. And it's, I mean, I put it away when company comes, but otherwise it sits out on the counter. And I literally just do all my stuff in there. And I find that if I empty it every three, four days, I don't have any fruit fly issues or anything like that. And so I think having a handy really just makes it convenient to do. So like I said, while we're preparing salads, you've gotten everything you need, what's left on the cutting board you don't want, you make sure it's all one to two inches, you just go over, you scrape it off, you're done and it's ready to go. No, I don't. It just literally sits right there. Now. One of those things you do not need to buy is those fancy little kitchen crocks with a lid because really all that lid is is a cover with a little carbon filter in them, which is supposed to keep odors out. I don't have any odors with it as long as you empty it regularly. I find that you're fine. And honestly, those are like, what, $20, $30 at Target? That was like something ice cream came in from King Super, you know? So, it has a and it has a handle. <laughs> What'd you say? You, you did? Did you? You were, what else do you have sitting out? Because I'm guessing, and that's the thing, yeah. I find that if I let my tomatoes go too long and they're starting to get kind of soft in the bowl, that's when I'm gonna have fruit flies more than I do from stuff like that. And that's the other thing I do. Great way to make a fruit fly trap is just to put about this much vinegar in a cup and put a couple little squirts of dish soap in it. They're attracted to the vinegar, but because of the film of the dish soap, they can't get off the, the liquid and you'll catch them every time. So. I, I've never heard that before. Cool. Yes. 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 Pack it. Yes. Yeah, that'd be fine. I mean, you're you're not throwing it in raw. You've mixed it into the water. Is what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. No, it'd be fine. No problem. Um, coffee grounds and filters. Um, so coffee grounds are great. Coffee grounds and actually eggshells, which are farther down there, those are worms two favorite foods. You want to know that because worms are the heavy lifters of the compost critters. They eat half their body weight in food every day. So we want to keep them happy. However, coffee grounds can be acidic. So when I say coffee grounds and filters, I'm talking your normal household usage. Even if you're the family that goes through a couple of pots of coffee a day, that's fine. But you should not be collecting all the coffee grounds from your 300 employee office. That is too much for your compost pile. But the filters, they would technically be a brown, but as far as you're concerned, just throw them in with the grounds and consider it the whole thing a green because the value is really the coffee grounds, okay? But I just take and throw the whole thing in. Um, I do try to use a brown filter, but if you use the white filters, that's not a problem. Most white filters are, are kind of bleached, if you want to say, with hydrogen peroxide these days, and it's not really bleach anymore. But still, if you can use the brown, it's, you know, it's just less chemicals you're putting in there, what little bit that is. Just know. Okay? Flowers are a green, correct, absolutely. Um, so um, tea bags would also be the green, um, and realize, particularly if you use like celestial seasonings, that entire thing will compost, but even if you use the kind with strings, strings are made of cotton, the little piece of paper is made of paper that will compost, the staple you will never see again. So don't worry about it, throw the whole thing in, okay? Um, breads and pastas. Um, 
People don't always think about those, but you got to go back to came from a living or once living thing. They're made predominantly of wheat or um, some kind of flour. So those can go in, but they can't have anything on it. So if you have a great loaf leftover of garlic bread, but it's got this buttery garlic thing on it, that can't go in. Now, some people say, or they've got some pasta with this nice oily you know, pesto sauce on it. Should I rinse it? And the answer is no. If you ever have to decide between saving a little waste and saving a little water in Colorado, you always save the water. So you don't rinse something off just to save that little bit of scrap to put in your compost. The fact of the matter is we do have more landfill space than we do of water. So if you have to ever choose if something would be a water hog to use, don't use it and instead just throw that away. Uh huh. Uh huh. You you should usually wash a little bit of it, particularly because right now the way we do compost or recycling, we commingle everything, and we want to keep as much food waste away from the paper because that can ruin the paper for our recycling. Is that right, no. Bethany? She's the recycling expert, so that's why. Yes. She's the recycling education person at Boulder County. So, but yes, you should rinse it, and that's fine. And, and I mean, it, it's it, it, you, technically that water doesn't get wasted because it gets recycled and you know things. But still, that's the idea. Anything oily or fatty should not go in. So, yes, um, the only any kind of, and not because the olive oil won't break down. The issue is it's gonna have such a strong odor, it's gonna attract things to your pile that you don't want. So that's why I discourage anything, even an olive oil or grapeseed oil or anything like that. Huh? I still would not do it because, I mean, it depends on what it is also. Like if you're talking, it's a little trace amount on something, but if you have a lot or it's got some rancid oil, I would not pour that in because that's gonna give off a strong odor and pervasive. Um, particularly if you have a volume of it that's going to make everything smell like it and really attract things. I mean, even though your barrel is closed, a strong bear or raccoon is going to find a way in. So that's the other reason I wouldn't. Um, and realize we will all compost someday. So there's some things I'm going to tell you not to put in mostly because we don't want to attract things to your pile or you don't want to have issues like that. So um, it's not that we will all compost someday. Um, let's talk about weeds, and since we talked about garden waste a little bit. So first rule is, is there's a couple categories for weeds. They're what we call noxious weeds, which are thistle and bindweed predominantly, and then there's the ones that are not as noxious, like lamb's wool, wild geranium, ones like that, okay? So here's the deal. Anything noxious, throw away. We do not want them in your compost pile. Now, that's if you don't have compost collection. If you have compost collection, you're welcome to put them in there. But realize, thistle and bindweed, in my opinion, are not going away from Colorado. I'm pretty sure there has to be at least a base root under the state that it has to be as big around as this room, based <laughs> upon the fact that it invades everywhere. And no matter what you do, it seems to be there. It's still there. In fact, um, I find that even trying to, you know, short of um, burning it, there's not a lot that seems to kill it. Um, I'm not encouraging you to spray it with chemicals. I'm just warning you that's what's going on. So I've come to realize as a Colorado gardener, I will be pulling it for the rest of my life no matter what I do to my yard and my garden. That being said, you can help yourself out a lot if you get rid of them and put them in the compost collection. The reason is, is that you need to get your um, pile up to 150 degrees for three consecutive days to kill off any weeds. We will never, ever get there um, in Colorado. Other parts of the country, you can get away with that. Here, you cannot. So that's why I encourage you to either um, put them in compost collection or, frankly, that is something I'm okay with putting in the landfill because we do not want that back. There's no value in that as far as we're concerned. If anything, they're invasive and noxious. The wild geranium, lamb's wool, um, those are the ones that will be like softer feeling or the, it looks like a geranium leaf. Um, those are not as invasive. Those, um, but still, if you throw them in your pile, you need to know, remember, what you put in your pile is what you get out of it. So if you put them in, Chances are you're going to pull them the next round. If you want to put them in your pile, which I don't blame you, help yourself out. Lay them out after you've pulled them 
on some pavement, some driveway, sidewalk, and let the sun bake the heck out of them for a couple of days. They're gonna look really shrivelly. They're gonna still be a green though, and then you throw them in. What you're trying to do is basically let the sun beat the heck out of them enough that they may die before they get into your compost pile so that they won't transfer on because your compost pile probably isn't going to kill it. Any weed, whether noxious or not, that's gone to seed, don't put in your pile because they will transfer on. They will not, uh, they will survive. So that's just the rules about weeds. So it all depends on how much you're willing to say, you know what, I'm gonna be picking it forever, what's a few more, versus like, I just can't see that much go to the landfill, I'm gonna work with it. You have to decide what you're comfortable with. Um, Eggshells, which is on your greens list next after the breads and pastas, that is the only kind of animal product of any kind allowed in your pile. So that does mean no fish, no bones, no skin, no matter what you identify as fish as a, you know, some people, if, if you're a vegetarian, some people eat that, but I mean no animal of any kind. So no skin, bones, meat, no fat, no dairy, no um, oil, because those things, not because they won't break down, because that's the stuff that gives off a really strong odor, which will attract things to your pile. Yeah, it's actually, you don't need to do that for the eggshells, um, but people do that in general sometimes for anything they're putting in their compost pile because it gets it past the fresh point. And usually people do that if they don't wanna get fruit flies. It's a fruit fly because it's no longer fresh enough that they would lay their eggs on. And so that's the idea. Um, so that might be why she did that, I don't know, that may be. Um, but just no, no animal product, no meat, nothing like that, okay? Um, we talked about manures, hair, skin cells. If you happen to have one of those vacuums that's a bagless vacuum, what your vacuum overwhelmingly picks up is hair and dead skin cells. So you can actually can take that thing and throw it, to empty it in your um, pile. Now that being said, if you have a bag vacuum, like I do, do not try to take the contents and shake it in there because it won't really come out. And it is not worth investing in a bagless vacuum. But if you happen to have one, just know that can go in because that overwhelmingly is picking up your and your pet's hair and dead skin cells and toenail clippings. All things, remember, came from a living or once living thing. So that's all stuff that can go in. Well, it's all, it, it, what little bit of it is. It, yeah, no, I mean, it's fine. It, they'll, they'll eat it. They'll eat each other at some point. So yeah, they would eat it. So it's, it's, I mean, you don't have to add it in. I'm just giving you another. Exactly. And that's part of the reason I suggest it because it's, you know, less organic material going to the land. It's a green. Yep, it's a green. So spent hops on the, we're still on the greens. Remember, look like a uh, brown, but is not. Weeds we talked about. Turn to the back page of that sheet. I've got a lot of yeses and nos on there. There's a couple other nos I want to mention. So um, first of all, any paper, paper product that you put in there must be porous. Should be able to soak up water. So that is not shredded office paper. Think about office paper, it, water bubbles on top of it. It is actually made to repel water. Think about newspaper, soaks up water. So you make sure you use, if you're gonna use any kind of paper as a brown, that you only use porous. So that would apply to napkins, paper towels, um, things like that. You can put paper plates in as well too, but make sure nothing is plastic coated. So that does mean no plastic coated paper. So like for example, freezer boxes, like you have a frozen pizza, you can't recycle that, but you also can't compost that. The reason is, is because it has lined with plastic. Now some of them are going to where they line the, um, the, the item inside with plastic. So then you can at least do something with the box, but not all. If you're not sure, you don't want those microplastics in your compost pile because those little shards are just gonna stay in there, okay? Um, also, there are things that are compostable that you do not want in your bin, such as this kind of stuff. 
all these things from the farmer's markets, the compostable cups and, and plates, bowls, silverware. These are all compostable, but they are not made to break down in your backyard pile. They're made to break down at those higher temperatures we're never gonna get to. So don't set yourself up for frustration um, also, similarly, any of those compostable bags, that those little green bio bags that you'll line your compost crock with if you, if you go that way, or sometimes that's what they'll have those bags in and, you know, when it's the um, zero waste events and the large trash can for compostables will be in one of those. Those also are made to break down at temperatures you're not going to get to, so don't throw those into your pile. You'll still see them around for quite a long time. Um, also be, be leery of the fact that composting is the cool new green term. You're gonna see compostable on a lot of products. If you remember about six, seven years ago, Sun Chips was gonna be cool. They're gonna be the first compostable chip bag. Notice it's not on the shelves anymore. A um, Couple things happened. First of all, they promised that it would break down in 90 days everywhere in the country. It does not break down in 90 days in a backyard pile in Colorado. It does in California. Um, also, they're very noisy and people didn't like the noise. So realize you'll see the word compostable on things that apply sometimes only if it's brand new. For example, kitty litter will have a big sign on that says it's compostable and kitty litter is compostable when your cat has never peed in it. The minute your cat pees in it, it's no longer compostable. So realize you're gonna see that on things be a little leery. Just because it is compostable doesn't mean you want it in your pile. Um, we talked a little bit about ash. Um, other things that I wanted to say. I think that's most things I wanted to specifically mention. There's some more no's on there too, but any other things you've heard that you can put in your pile or you're not sure if you can put in that you wanted to ask about or... Correct. Most of those. Yep. Mm -hmm. No, that's pretty much it. Um, basically, anything that's going to throw off your pH for some reason. Oh, that's the other thing I should say. Citrus. Citrus is always a rumor out there that you shouldn't use. Fine to use. Again, normal household usage. So that does mean grapefruit, orange, lime, lemon. It's fine to use. You still have to one to two inches, so if you've got half of one you squeeze into something, you gotta chop it up a little bit, um, more than just a half of a one or, or, or eat your half grapefruit in the morning, but your normal household usage. If for some reason you are making some kind of lemon marmalade and you've got you know a bucket full of lemons, that will be too much citri citric acid. It's the acid which will throw off the pH. That's always the rumor around it. Normal household usage, when you're just using it and cooking and stuff, fine. But if you have a volume for some reason, I would not put all that in, okay? Not really anything else that I can think of. Those are all the things that that's what I usually talk about. So I think pretty much most everything else you can put in your bin. Everything you can put in your backyard pile could go to a commercial operation. So sometimes even if you just have a volume of stuff and you just don't want to deal with it, maybe you happen to have a lot of greens right now and you don't have enough browns. You, if you have the compost collection, there's no reason. You can't send anything there. Um, one of the other things I want to mention is if you go to the page about the critters, front side, go to the back side. This is about where to get extra so maybe you're thinking, okay, I can get a bunch of browns right now. How do I get a bunch of greens? So here are places that tend to have lots of greens. And so this is good to know, particularly if you're gonna get your pile started. It does help to have your pile at least be a good, your bin to be at least a good half full. If your bin isn't half full, it's not enough volume to make it worth their while to come. So you won't see much activity until that bin is a good, probably half full. So it does help to kind of get a good volume going and then you can kind of add as you generate product. Um, but if you only start with a couple inches, there's no reason you can't. Just know you're not gonna see much change until it gets to be about half full or so, okay? It's basically, no, no, they don't work. They don't work. So there's, there's a lot of marketing around composting, um, but it's not really truth, and that is one of those, or those ones that, you know, it's like in a drawer, and I'm like, there is no way that thing is gonna work. 
Um, and most of those ones that sit on the counter are really what they say, they call it a compost pail. So you think, oh, it's going to compost right in there, but really it's just a pail. And it's a pail to hold your compost most of the time. So, um, so greens. Places that I like to get them, there's several places there. Barbers, realize you just need to think about these days, a lot of people do dye their hair, so could have some chemicals on their hair um, that, the, that they sweep up. Grocery stores are a good place, but check with the produce people. Sometimes they have a relationship with like a humane society or something where they'll take all those kind of scraps from the vegetables and things and give them to them as food for like rabbits or other animals and stuff. So you may not be able to get it there. And um, about a year or two ago, we started to hear that King Super was getting more hesitant about doing it because they were a, they had gotten sued by somebody who said they were taking it to start a compost pile, but then ate it and then claimed that their food made them sick and yada, yada, yada. So just know you, you may not get it at the grocery store, but you can always ask. I find the easiest place is the juice bars and coffee shops. And my secret place is at 30th and Arapaho. If you're going to the King Supers right there, right by it um, is a Starbucks and a Jamba Juice. So I find that if I call them in the morning and say, hey, I'm starting a compost pile, can you hold some stuff for me? If I go there after work, even if they forgot to hold it, if they just empty their trash bags, I can usually walk away with about three to four bags like this full of either orange rinds, wheatgrass, stuff like that from the juice place, or coffee grounds mixed in with their filters from Starbucks. Now, I know that oranges is a lot of oranges, but again, as long as you're just doing that one time and that's your start and you keep adding, you'll, you'll balance that diet out enough, that'll be fine. I just don't want to make you concerned about starting with that much coffee grounds. You know, I'd put like one bag of each in for some greens and then put in a whole bunch of your leaves or something for your browns. Okay? Um, that's what I was just going to say. I know there's the new alfalfas up here. Do they do that as well? And my experience is, is the more natural the grocery store, the more much more willing they are to work with you on those kind of things. And Whole Foods is putting in a huge one. Oh, good. I didn't know that. That's new. Great. Cool. Great. So the other thing is, is on here is um, notice that neighbors and friends, make sure this is, you know, it comes as a double-edged sword. You might get a neighbor who said, oh, I'll give you some stuff for your compost pile, but you might want to look carefully at what you're getting from them too because they may not, you know, I even have a husband who's been married to me for a long time and I still have to retrain and retrain. So just realize you, it may not quite go as smoothly if you're getting it from a place you don't control. With the pet You're fine. Yeah, same thing also if you feed your grass to people do that a couple times a year. As long as you, I wouldn't like maybe like you feed the grass today and you mow the lawn tomorrow and collect those grass cuttings. I maybe wouldn't use those, but next week, no problem. That stuff tends to dissipate pretty quickly and stuff, so I wouldn't worry about that. But notice under the browns, the carbons, the only place to really get them is the leaf drop-offs this time of the year and the yard waste drop-off. That's really it. Um, so that's why save your leaves now. Even if you don't have some in your yard, go to a park, rake some up, get some from a friend. And if there are um, any of the leaf drop-off locations, I find, particularly if you go there on a Saturday, people already bring them bagged up, ready to go. You don't even have to do the work. You just unload them from their car and put them in yours. So it is pretty easy, particularly this time of the year, but do it this time of the year. And how much? At least three to four bags is what I would say, particularly if you've never done this before and you don't have a stash to begin with. I mean, I have six bags next to my compost pile right now and I'm still gonna rake up all my leaves and hang on to them. So um, you definitely, you can't generally have too many um, unless you run out of space. But I mean, you always need them. So that's why it's helpful to have them. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So it is really helpful to have. So yeah, definitely can't say enough. 
everybody, like, I'll just tell you, like, classes in the spring will have, like, 30 people, you know, but everybody thinks about it then, and then they're like, ah, I don't have any browns, you know? So B, you guys are the smart ones. And I would just also say, if you haven't started composting yet, do not start. You wanna just stash, get ready, so you'll be ready to roll in the spring. You can compost year-round, I don't compost year round because it still requires doing the same maintenance and stuff we're gonna talk about next. And when it's like, you know, negative 30, I'm not going outside and stirring that pile, okay? So just know I do that too. So um, realize um, if you haven't, I would, I would get yourself ready to go. Even if you have, get yourself some browns because you're gonna need them for all next season, okay? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. Mm -hmm. Those are browns when they Cor Correct. Yeah. And the thing is, is always be, I always prefer if you can get your own because you never know what's been in it. That's the thing. Or even just like weeds are mixed in and stuff like that. Okay. So let's talk about another piece of this, which is water. I'm going to leave this up here for now. So this is um, not written down anywhere except on your little five um, reminders at the front of your handout, so you do need to pay attention to this, okay? There's no handout about this because it's really more practical than that. Your pile needs to be at all times damp as a wrung out sponge, okay? So that is not an exact sounding thing, but it really makes sense when you think about it. What I mean by that is if I open up my bin, we've got a 50-50 mix by volume, I'm trying to make sure it's moist enough. If I open up the bin and look at it, I guarantee it's not gonna look moist enough because keeping your pile moist enough is your biggest problem for composting in Colorado. It's such a dry, arid climate, constantly your bin is going to dry out on the exposed side. So imagine this is my bin. By the way, this is open on the bottom. That's how your bin should be, so it's in direct contact with the ground. This is my bin, it's full of stuff. Let's just use it as full. We'll talk about partial full here in a second. But if I open it up and look at it, this is going to look dry. And if I could open this up, it would look dry and this would look dry because it's exposed to the air. The most active part of the pile, where the pile is going to be the most moist, where the critters are going to hang out, is going to be the center. That's going to be the most active part of your pile. So you cannot open it up and look at it and go, hmm, I think it's dry. You have to get in there and stir it around first. Now what you wanna do, first of all, is get your pitchfork. This is the tool you have to have. I have some other ones to show you, which are options, but this is the thing you have to buy. If you don't have one of these, you need one of these. Notice this is the flat part kind. It is not the kind that like go to a point and they're like a lethal weapon, a hay fork. You want a garden pitchfork, okay? So what you gotta do is even out this moisture content before you do what I call the squeeze test. So literally, we have to get in there with our pitchfork and mix this all up. So you go in here, you take your lid off, you get your pitchfork out, and you go in here and you mix it up like a big bowl of brownie mix so that you even that up, okay? So the idea is, is then we have evened out the moisture content. Then you do what I call the squeeze test. This is where you literally reach your hand into the bin, grab some, squeeze it, and let it go. Drop it back into the bin. It should be damp enough that it sticks a little to your hand, but not so wet that water's running down your arm. That is damp as a wrung out sponge, okay? That's how damp it should be. Now, realize the green stuff we're adding has a lot of moisture content, but this stuff doesn't. So you may have to add water. You will probably have to add water, probably um, at least a couple of times you do it. How do you do this? This is where your bin's location makes all the difference. It has to be convenient to the hose. Do not put it across the yard and tell yourself you will carry the five gallon bucket of water out there because you will not do it, okay? Have it convenient to the hose have a hose spigot that you can turn it on and leave it running. So if you have the kind that's like a squeeze trigger, you're gonna have to take the spigot off or have the kind you can leave running and literally stick the hose in the middle of the bin. Same's gonna apply for your type of bin as well too. 
you would um, stick it in the middle of the bin, let it run for a few minutes, pull it out. Do the same thing again, even out that moisture content because it's going to be really wet in the middle and you want to even that out throughout the whole pile. Then you do your squeeze test again. Do that until it is damp as a wrung out sponge. So there's a couple things happening when you do this. This is the maintenance part. It is dealing with the water, but it's also dealing with the air. When we get in there with the pitchfork and mix it up, we are fluffing everything back up. So first of all, with the water, the water is so critical is because of those microorganisms. Remember, single-celled organisms are the first responders. They cannot move around the pile. They have to move from water droplet to water droplet. Second level guys, worms, they breathe through their skin, which is covered with water. If the pile's too dry, they can't breathe. They can move and they'll leave. So you have to keep that pile moist enough, okay? So that's why water is so critical, but you don't want it too moist and you pretty much can't make it too moist in Colorado. It's too dry here. Things will dry out too quickly, um, but you also need air for them because the other piece that's going to happen with your bin is that the volume is going to change as the pile is there. So just for right now, let's imagine we filled our bin up 50-50 mix by volume. We've made sure it's damp as a wrung out sponge and we leave it alone. Say we come back in a week or two, it's not going to be up here anymore. The top's going to be about down to here. What's going on is all those pieces that were one to two inches in size have now been chomped on and they're getting smaller and smaller in size and so those natural forming air pockets are starting to collapse and those pieces are compacting, okay? So the whole volume is going to go down a little bit. We get in there with our pitchfork, we mix it all up, we make sure it's damp as a wrung out sponge with our squeeze test, and we're gonna fluff it back up. What we're gonna do is we're gonna add oxygen back in at that time when we do that, which is what they need, the air, okay? You're gonna fluff it back up. It won't be quite as high as maybe where it was, but you'll fluff it back up a little bit, come back in a few weeks, be down to here. We do this again, we do this again, when it's finished, you're going to have about this. Half to a third of your original volume will turn into finished compost, okay? So that's all you're going to get. How fast does this happen? All depends on you, how well you maintain it, how well you do things at the beginning. If you don't do one to two inches in size, it's not going to happen that fast. The fastest you're ever gonna get it out is about 60 to 90 days for one batch. That's if you filled it all the way to the top, had a 50-50 by volume, everything was one to two inches in size, it was a nice balanced diet, you kept it damp as a wrung up sponge the whole time, you didn't add any fresh material, that would be the fastest you're gonna get it. Most people are gonna get two, if you're really lucky, maybe three batches a season. A season predominantly is March, depending on the weather, how early you can go, to November, again, how early you can go. The critters will still keep composting in the winter. If you want to try to do it, you can do it year round, but they're going to slow down. You're not going to see them produce as much, and you still have to get out there with a the pitchfork, turn it, and keep it damp as a wrung out sponge using your hose. I turn my hose off in the winter and most people do, which is why most people here in Colorado don't tend to compost year round. You can, there's no reason you can't. Just know you won't see near as much, so don't have as high of expectations. Yes, it's helpful if you have a full bin to start because you get the critters to come and then they want to stay there um, versus if you get a little bit until you have that volume, it's gonna, so it's going to take a while for your population to get there. Whereas if you have a full mount at the beginning, you're right. They're more likely to come because it's much more worth their while and once they come, they want to stay. Okay? All right. So let's talk about the bins 
what kind of bins to get and um, which uh, ones I like and don't like. So I'm going to tell you to, um, actually, you know what? Pause that for a moment. We'll talk about building a bin first. So not a bin, but the, yeah, the pile. So turn to the next page of your handout after the yeses and nos. This is a good little sheet. You don't have to look at it in detail, but I'll just show you generally what it says. If you want to build a pile from scratch, put your bin on the ground. Please note that it has to be on the ground. Critters cannot jump. <laughs> so you want this bin in direct contact with the ground, not a half inch off the ground, not on your deck, not on your gravel. It needs to be on dirt, on grass, not on something that has weed cloth underneath it. They need to have free access. Because the good thing is, is they will um, come up as the conditions are good for them, but life is going to happen, and you're not going to get out there and maintain it, and the pile's going to dry out, and they'll leave. But the good news is they'll come back when you get it going again. So that's why it's really important to have that kind of open system so they can come and go as they need to, okay? So on the ground. Then you want to get your volume materials to start. Start with the three inches. I think your pot, your diagram says four to six. It does not matter really the size. All that matters is that they're even. So like a three inch layer of browns, three inch layer of greens. And again, you're eyeballing it. You do not need the ruler out. This is not that exact. Just, you know, you're thinking like, oh, I got about that much. Okay, I'll put about that much, you know, that kind of thing. Same when you're bringing out your kitchen scraps. If you look at it and you're like, oh, I got about this much, you grab about this much browns. It doesn't have to be that exact, okay? So you've got your three inch, three inch. You mix the two together. This is where you get out your pitchfork, mix it up, put your hose in it, make it damp as a rung off sponge. Repeat. Do that until you run out of materials or the bin is full. That's how you do your bin. Now, realize this is purely for a diagram purposes. I should never be able to cut open your bin and see stratospheric layers, because remember, this should be mixed up at all times. So this is purely to help you understand the volume. It should be that you'll have some stuff, um, some greens that maybe you put in a month ago right next to something you added last week, because it's all going to be mixed up. We will talk about how you can sort that out and use some stuff in the different stages of that, okay? But I just want to make sure you understand that's how you can build a bin. Now, if you're thinking, well, I've got a bin. It's been sitting there for a while. I haven't really done much with it. What do I do with that? Is that a waste? Do I throw it away? Do I start over? What do I do? Realize if you have a bin sitting there with some, some stuff in it. Remember, things become a brown. So generally, an older pile is pretty much all brown at this point. That's fine. You can still use it. If you can still tell what you put in there, you can still see the chunks of leaves and sticks or, or a you know, petrified piece of banana peel. That is pretty much a brown at this point. So you can pull that out and use that as your source of browns. But realize the fresher the material, the more things are going to be attracted to your pile. So you want to try to mix some fresh stuff in if you can. So if you want to pull out this older pile and then use that plus maybe some fresh browns just to mix in with your greens that you're going to either collect or get, that would be fine. So it's not like it's a waste, but realize that's the um, pretty much an old pile is a brown. Okay? All right, now let's talk about bins. So turn to the next page in your handout. I'm going to tell you why this bin, personally, I own two of this bin you see in front of you. Um, I do not get paid to endorse this, just so you guys all know. The county also thinks these are really good, and they have them available for you tonight if you would like to buy one, and they're selling them to you at cost. $55, isn't that right what it is? They brought these in in a big truckload this spring, and they usually do that each year. If you try to find this anywhere online, right now the cheapest place I can find it is Amazon. It's like 87 bucks or something like that, plus shipping. This is a good price. So if you are interested in a bin or you're interested in this bin, no, you will not find it cheaper. And I'm going to tell you, you're not going to find it in any local store. 
We've tried to have, um, over years ago, tried to have McGuckins and places um, offer it. The problem is, is that once they put their profit markup on it, which I understand, it's 110 bucks. And part of the reason the county wants to keep it cheap for you is we want you to try it, because composting may not be for you, but that way you don't have a ton invested in it, and then you feel like, why did I do that, you know? So um, try it um, and see if you like it, but just know I think this bin is really good. And here's several reasons why. First of all, whatever you use, this is the shelter we're talking about right now. It needs to have these same characteristics. It doesn't matter to me if you don't buy this one, but you want a bin with similar features. First thing your bin has to have is a locking lid. This actually has little handles, so I can pick up the whole bin with it. Um, I like this lock particularly because of that reason. I don't like any of the lids that supposedly lock on by you turning it like a big screw cap. What I find is you think you have those threads lined up and um, you don't. And one of the things we have in Colorado is we have wind, a lot of it. And if it is not latched down well, the lid will be gone. The lid is critically important because with the moisture loss we're fighting, you have to have some kind of lid. So even if you want to make your own bin, you can do that, but you've got to use some kind of lid, an old piece of carpet, an old piece of cardboard, something to reduce that moisture loss. So I like a locking, tight-fitting lid. You also want a bin that is solid pieces. This is four pieces that bolt together in the corners um, with real nuts and bolts. And it's coming a little apart because we take it around to our demonstrations. But that's what you want. There are some that look just like this out there that are stacking pieces. Any of those stacking pieces look good until you start thinking about this volume change. That bin's gonna sit half empty at some point when that volume is down to half of its original volume. So if you have a good strong bear or raccoon and it's just stacking pieces, they can just knock some of those pieces right off the top. But if it's four solid pieces, they hold together. The other great thing about the solid pieces, there's a trick that you can do for turning with this kind of bin that you can't do with other bins, which is that you can treat it like a big jello mold. The bin will hold to the shape that the pile will hold to the shape of your bin. So you kind of got to wiggle it off the sides because the stuff will kind of be sticking to the sides. But then you can physically pick the frame up, put it right next to it, and pitchfork the whole pile over. It's a way you can really mix and stir up the pile without having to get all the way into the corner of the bin. So if you have enough space to consider moving your bin back and forth, it's a great option with this kind of bin that you won't have with any of the stacking bin pieces. You want something with real nuts and bolts. Even this bin did not come with real metal nuts and bolts. Um, unfortunately, a couple years ago, they switched out the plastic bolts. I'm telling you right now, go to McGuckin, spend $3 and get metal bolts and nuts. You'll be much happier. The plastic ones will snap, okay? Um, it's a cost saving, and unfortunately, that's what they're all doing. Um, the other thing I like about this bin is that it's very tight. With that lid on top, if you notice, the holes in this bin are very little. Things cannot get in. More importantly, little paws cannot get in. There are some compost bins out there with like holes this big around. That's just like an open smorgasbord for the amount of wildlife we have here. You need a tight bin that will keep wildlife out. You also want a tight bin to keep that moisture in. We want this bin to almost be as tight as we can make it from a moisture standpoint to keep that moisture in because the moisture is what keeps the pile active. If the pile dries out, those critters leave and nothing is happening, okay? So you gotta make sure that it stays that way. Um, the other thing I like about this bin, let me say one more thing, is that this is thicker plastic. Realize you are pushing against this bin with a heavy tool here. Um, so realize you'll be pushing against it. You want something that's gonna hold up, and you want something that pieces are more upright like this, not that they angle in, because what I find is the ones that angle in more, you'll end up snapping off the top pieces of that plastic as you push against it with your pitchfork. Also, as it gets cold out, it gets brittle, and those little bits of plastic at the top are gonna start snapping off. Yes? Do 
So you do not need to go out to your bin more than once a week. And even once a week is ideal. You really got to go out and turn and water and do the squeeze tests at least once a month. So you've got plenty of time if you're going to only be gone for a week or two. And honestly, the great thing is, is life is also going to happen. Something's going to go on, you're going to have a family emergency, and you're just going to stop doing anything with it for three months. And the pile is going to dry out, and things are going to leave. But by having that open system, they will come back when you get it damp enough, you add some fresh greens, and get it going again. So you don't have to worry about that. Yes? So, uh, in the, in the mm -hmm. you mentioned, like, the cinder block Correct. Personally, this is my favorite choice. Um, what I find with the pallet bins, if you want to go to the recycling center, um, back by where the household hazardous waste drop off, there's actually a demonstration site where they have several of these kind of bins, including a couple of those. You can see them in action. This one tends to do the best because what I find with the pallet bin dries out. It's also still kind of open for the critters, but more of the issue is it dries out. The cinder block one tends to do better because it becomes like a solid wall, like a U-shape laid on the ground, if you want to think of it. But you still got to put some kind of lid on it. And because of the wind, it's hard to keep the lid on without blowing away. This is where I find, like, and that's where I'm like, oh, 55 bucks sounds a whole lot easier than building one of those <laughs> to me. So that's why I have two and not one of those. <laughs> So, um, but you, you, you know, people make them out of old tires. Um, if you do want to make it yourself, try to line it. Um, people often make it out of um, some kind of wooden frame and chicken wire. Um, but if you do, as much as I'm not a big fan of using the plastic, I suggest trying to line it with some kind of black plastic or something because that's too open and airy. But if, even though you're going to end up poking holes through that plastic over time, it will keep more of that moisture in to keep the pile more active and stuff. So just realize those are always the trade-offs if you use something else like that. Um, things you want to avoid, um, if you, I'm looking at the features here, basically, um, let's talk about um, tumbling bins. Basically, you want something in direct contact with the ground. And also, be leery of anything. Um, Costco made a knockoff that looked just like this bin, um, this soil saver one. And um, it looked great, except it didn't have bolts in the corner. It had like little plastic tabs that were supposed to zipper together. And it worked pretty well when it was empty. But then at some point, there's going to be 100 pounds of wet, heavy uh -huh. stuff in here. And all it did was just spring the corners apart. Mm -hmm. So realize, be careful of anything like that. Um, let's talk about tumbler bins. I'll be honest, I'm sorry, I'm not a fan. <laughs> um, she brought one with her, I think, from California, right? Is that where you brought it from? Oh, you bought it here. And you did the, just a, like a cinder block one, yes, with wood and stuff, yeah. So here's the deal. Everybody thinks the tumbler bins are a great option because of the turning. And there's real downsides with them. First of all, think about it. It's not an open system. It's a closed system, so those critters don't jump. Remember we said that? So you're going to have to introduce them. So this is the one and only time you are allowed to put soil in your compost pile. Just so you know that. I know that's out there on the internet that you're supposed to like layer it with soil. Not true. Soil is heavier than compost. It will actually weigh the compost down, and you'll see it'll actually collapse some of those air pockets we're trying to create. So that's not true, except you've got to introduce this population to that bin. So if you have some compost, that'd be my first choice, a few handfuls of that. If you don't, then a few handfuls of soil to help get that population started. So that's the first thing. And just to clarify, I'm talking about those kind that are off the ground. Yep. And if you do want one, the one rule is get one that lays on its side, not one that is upright. There are some that are upright, and it looks really good when they're empty, and they turn great in the store when they're empty. And then you put 100 pounds of stuff, and you're having to push pretty hard to push that one over. And you will find that the, the amount inside kind of becomes a lump, and the lump just kind of shifts with the bin. It doesn't break up. So I find that if you have one, you still have to open the door, get in there with your hands, with your pitchfork, mix it all up and everything too. Like the that also can happen. If you want one of these, there are one kind that I kind of like um, called the Mantis. The problem is, is they're $300 for a single barrel, okay? The reason I like it, it has these little gear wheels and has a crank 
that you turn it and it actually turns the barrel. So it's not based upon your strength to turn that weight, but it's a mechanism that helps. The other problem is, is you will find that when you go to water it, these little holes that serve as little vent holes that it has, just like these same little holes we have down here, will turn into drain holes when you put your hose in, that you will find that the water drains out. I find that if you can get them going, they do pretty well. But getting them going and really actively going is a little tough. You're doing pretty well when you said you've gotten yours up to 100 degrees for a day. I don't think it's like actively, like it's going. It's, it's not doing very much. So like it has, it has a mold. It's a mold. That's like a bad no, that's actually, that's the first responders. That's a good thing. But it's what... No, and it's not going to be. Um, and, and, and I find because, particularly in Colorado, they don't do as well because the... the right <laughs> it does, it does. So unfortunately, you're going to see all your effort just go. The only people I found to be really effective with these are people who are retired, who <laughs> literally stay home, don't travel. Because what they do is once you get them going, if you go out and turn it every day, they would do like one full turn every day, and once they got it going, it had enough in there that it would kind of keep its own moisture in there, that they didn't have to water it too much. They did pretty well, but they're the only people I've ever seen successful with these. And they're expensive. I mean, even um, the Home Depot made one with a crank and stuff for like $125, $150 is like the cheapest I've ever seen them. So they're expensive. I would not recommend getting one and start with this, particularly if you are new to composting, because you really want, you know, you don't want to invest hundreds of dollars and then be really frustrated, because I think it will frustrate you in addition to you also spend a lot of money. So um, I would encourage you to do something like this instead, or make your own instead of doing one of those. Um, Exactly. That's exactly what happens. That's exactly right. The other thing I need to tell you about bins is if you look in that bottom left-hand picture here of your handouts, realize there's a lot of marketing around compost. So they all have this little door. Even this one has it. They have these little doors. And the picture shows that, oh, you just put things in the top and you just open the door and beautiful compost comes out the bottom. Well, that's marketing and that's not reality. You do not need these little doors for anything, but they all come with it. And people said, well, why do they have it if you don't need it? I'm like, because you would wonder why it wasn't there, you know? Um, so unfortunately, it doesn't apply. You're still going to have to take it all mostly in and out from this way because, remember, we're mixing it up all the time. It's not going to be that you just keep adding to the top really nicely, okay? Um, turn to the back side of that page. Let's talk about tools a little bit. So pitchfork. Get this at any Target, Walmart, Home Depot, McGuckins, anything like that, okay? Should be like 15 to 20 bucks. This you have to have. This I encourage you to have. Um, you can make your own, but you're going to either pile. You have to have one of these. This is absolute. These other options are purely options. These are what we call compost aerators. It's another way of turning. I do like them for um, using for kind of a quick thing. The pitchfork is when I'm going to do some serious amount of mixing and stuff. So here's how I use them and, and different things about them. This is my personal favorite of them out there. Um, this is a favorite of a lot of other people. I'll, the hard thing is these now cost about the same. This used to be way cheap, but then when oil prices went up a long time ago, they got to be very expensive, and now they're each like 20-some bucks. So this feels like you're getting a lot more because it's metal and all that kind of stuff. But pros and cons. Longer phalanges, um, and, but I like this because it's shorter. Notice features they have in common. These both have a T-shaped handle on top. You only want one of these with a T-shaped handle. There are some that are out there that have like a 90 degree handle, like a handle one way and a handle this way. You're not going to use those. They don't work as well. The reason these are nice, though, is you end up using your arms for more up and down motion. And how these work is the phalanges go up as you push them in. And then when you go to pull them back up, they pull the material back up with it. So you use arm motions like this and less reach and pull with your back the way you have to with the pitchfork more. So it's a nice alternative, but it's never going to replace your pitchfork, okay? 
Um, if you do get one of these, I like I said, both are really good. The reason I like this plastic one is because he's short. And the reason I like him is he stays right in my bin. He le I literally leave him there so that I never have to worry also if he's going to rust or anything. This is powder coated metal. It should never rust, but too tall to stay in my bin. So that's why I tend to always have to remember to go get him. So I tend not to use him. I tend to like this one because he's handy. And then I go get the pitchfork and I'm serious. So what I mean by I'm doing is, is when I'm going out and adding food waste, and I'm like, oh, gosh, I haven't been out here in a while, you know? This is handy. I can get it out, and I do a couple good things, get a little air going in there, mix it up a little bit, and then I put the lid back on and forget it. So um, that's the reason I like it is because it's convenient. But this, like I said, is 20-some bucks. And you can only find this one online. Um, the web address is there. It's on Amazon. That's the only place. In fact, for many years, I thought you couldn't find it again, and then it kind of resurfaced about four years ago, but only online. This one, you can buy in person. You can buy it online. McGuckins has it. I'm pretty sure Home Depot has it, um, and I'm guessing Lowe's would too, but it's like 28 bucks. So these are not cheap. You need to spend the money on the pitchfork and the bin. Top two priorities. This is purely secondary if you want it. Okay, so let's talk about how you actually add materials to your bin. So here's my little kitchen pail. I'm coming out. I take the lid off. The worst thing you can do is what I call dump and run, which is open the lid, put my bucket on, put the lid back on. That's like the worst thing you can do. Yes, as I say, I'm sure we're all recognizing how guilty we are. So. You want to, first of all, add the browns in, but there's things you can do about how you put it in that will help you with the wildlife issue we have here, okay? So your bin is full, okay? Oh, this, this is the bad one. Let me grab the better one. Here we go. So my bin, here I'm coming up to my bin. Here's the top of it, okay? Last thing I should do is put all this stuff here on the top because all you're doing is just advertising the fact that you have a compost bin and there's fresh stuff here. Come, please smell and check it out. Because realize their sense of smell is tons better than ours, which means they can smell this stuff a long ways away. Instead, you want to dig out a little pocket. So literally push the pile aside. Put your kitchen scraps in, your greens. Grab your handful of browns that are right there next to your bin and put in the same volume. Then push the pile back over on top of it so that the pile itself acts as a biofilter. Then you put the lid back on top. This is also where a tight fitting lid acts as another filter so that we reduce the chances of giving off any strong smells. Plus by putting it into the pile, you get it closer to where those critters really are, are and are active, which means they're going to get after it right away. They're going to break it down past that fresh point where it's going to give off any smells. So don't dump and run. Okay? All right. So I'm just checking to make sure. Um, all right. Great. Um, let's talk about a couple things you should not spend your money on. There are other things out there. Um, like a compost starter. That is basically like dehydrated microorganisms. You do not need that. These guys occur naturally in the soil. Um, you do not need to add anything special, but your bin has to be in contact with the ground, or if you're going to try the barrel bin, you've got to get something in there to introduce those microorganisms in there. But those starter um, things are usually like 20, 25 bucks. You don't need that. It's the same stuff that's in the soil. You may have to help your soil out a little bit. Like if you bought a new house and it is like completely packed down, super hard dirt, break the dirt up a little bit, help them out. Realize it may be harder because particularly if it's new construction, they have scraped off all that topsoil with all the good stuff in it. So it may take a little longer for them to come. But they will come. Just know that. People also wonder if they should buy worms to add to their bin. When you're buying worms, those are red wiggler worms. That's what the composting worm is. It's the same worms for a worm bin. That's my worm bin from my house right there. 
Um, we will look at that at the end, but you do not need to buy worms and add them in. If for some reason you have an abundance of worms from your worm bin, you can throw them in, but you don't need to. There's no reason you have to. Um, other things, you don't need a compost thermometer. People have them. They look like a glorified meat thermometer. They're just extra long. I can tell you, your pile is going to be closer to 80 when you add the fresh greens. It's going to hang around 60 to 65 most of the rest of the time. That's how all the piles are in Colorado. It's just what happens. So you don't need to know that. I mean, you can if you really are interested, but just realize it's not going to change anything. So, and they're 20 bucks or 25, so you don't need to spend your money on those. Um, other things. Um, the biggest issue is because it's um, dry, so we can't, there's not enough moisture to make enough of them want to come and be in our pile. That's our biggest problem. And then we also get cold at times. You know, even in the summer, it can get cool at night. And so they're just not as active when the temperature's cooler. And really, the temperature in your pile is actually given off by the body heat of the microorganism. That's really what it is. So artificially heating your bin, like some people have tried to send their um, hot tub water tubes or something through it, thinking it would heat it up, um, it doesn't really help because that's really what it's a measure of. That's why people assume a hotter pile is a more active pile, and it is because more microorganisms are in there, but it's, we can't get ours to, our, our volume and our conditions won't sustain a population larger than that will be about 60 to 80 degrees, okay? All right, so let's talk about how you know when it's finished, how you get the compost out, and uh, what you do with it. So, first of all, we have our bin, Let's imagine we've been, first of all, we filled it all the way up. Let's just say we filled it all the way up. We let it all finish cooking down. If you can do that, that's ideal. Because what's going to happen at some point in those two to three months, 60 to 90 days, if you've kept it damp as a ring sponge, you're going to have a whole nice pile of finished compost. That's ideal and that's great. Most people can't do that. Most people have one bin. So obviously, Maybe you're going to see some finished stuff that, you know, it's July and you'd like to pull some of that stuff out, but you just added some new materials last week. What do you do? You have to be prepared to sort is the first thing. You either can sort by hand, and literally the sorting is anything you still recognize as what it is is not finished. Anything that you can't tell what it is is finished. There's going to be a few exceptions, like you're going to see a few eggshell pieces hanging around or maybe a little piece of a peach pit or an avocado pit, that's fine. If you can, pull those out and throw them in for a second round. But even if you ended up just putting them wherever you use the compost, they really won't hurt anything too much because they're going to be small and very, very little. But just know you may see things like that. But the majority will look like what we passed around. Finished, looks like dirt, dark, lush, moist. That's when it's finished. And you can just separate out by hand, or sometimes people make themselves a little screen made out of like chicken wire or something like that, okay? Um, or you can also do where some people will have two bins, somebody mentioned that, where they'll be adding to this bin, and about the time they get this bin full, they'll stop adding to it, and they'll start adding to this bin. Meanwhile, we're maintaining this. We go out every couple of weeks, keep it damp as a wrung out sponge, turn it. We're not adding fresh content here. We're only adding fresh content here. In about three months or so, this bin will be full. This one will be all finished cooking down. We'll stop adding to this bin. We'll pull all our finished compost out of this one, and we'll start adding our fresh content to that. So that's sometimes what people end up doing, particularly if you are a larger household, you may be generating more material. That might be an option. If you have not composted before, start with one. I only got a second bin after like 10 years of doing this. So it takes a while to get to where you kind of know what you're doing with that. So don't worry, start with one if you haven't done this before. Just realize you may have to either hand sort out or the other option is stop adding. At some point, you can just say, my bin's pretty full. You don't add any more fresh materials. You continue to maintain it, keep it damp as a wrung out sponge and turn it. Meanwhile, what do you do with your product? Your browns are sitting there in your leaf bags, ready to go for the next batch. You can collect your greens. Literally, sometimes, particularly over the winter when people aren't composting or during this time, they just keep putting their food waste into Ziploc bags in their freezer. So in the two, three months when this is done, 
they then can start over with another volume and they've got a whole bunch of greens plus this whole stash of browns and they can do that that way. Or over the winter, you save up so that by the time you want to get your pile going again in the spring, you've got a bunch of greens to use. So that's certainly a way to do it. Or you have a worm bin like me and you put all your greens during the time you're not using this in your worm bin, you can do that. Or you can also even, you know, um, if you have compost collection, send them to the compost collection when you're not using, or you've got maybe more volume than you want to handle in your one bin system. Those are all options depending on what you want to do. Okay? No. Mm -mm. No, it doesn't. Because they're going to come naturally from the soil anyway, so even though there's some usually on the produce, and what that does happen is it kind of puts ice crystals through them, so it actually kind of starts breaking them down, and they're already getting almost past that fresh point, too, which well, they won't have as many smells and stuff, too. So there's advantages to it, but you got to have freezer space, and, you know, that's the other issue. Okay? So then what do you do with the compost? So if you've got finished compost, what can you do with it? If you go to next page of your handout, how to use compost. There's some specifics on here, but generally it falls into two categories, finished and partially finished. So let's talk about finished first. This is this stuff. You can basically, this stuff is stable. Um, it will not harm anything to put it on anything. So you can use this anywhere. Use it in your garden, use it in your household plants. Use it as a mix with um, some topsoil to grow starts. It actually on its own will grow starts well, it just won't sustain the growth. So if you're just trying to get some seedlings to grow, you could use compost, but then you will need to transfer them soon after they sprout. Um, basically, there's not anywhere you, you can't use it. If you are not a gardener and you just want to do the right thing with your food waste, bag it up and give it to your gardener friends. They will be thrilled. This is black gold to gardeners. I mean, nobody I know produces more compost than they want. Everybody wants more compost than they produce. Even I buy compost every season to add to my garden beds because I don't even begin to produce how much I want. So realize you're, it, it's valuable stuff, and it's yours because you know what you put into it. So if you're going to use it, maybe on your prized rose bush, you're going to be super careful about what you put in it, you know? So that's why this is valuable stuff. So um, just know if you don't have any place to do it, you can just throw it out into the yard. It'll weather in. Um, you can dig it in. Ideal is to dig it in before you plant, or um, if you can, and it can because it's finished compost, you can put it in and immediately plant. There's nothing, there's no problem with that. Um, but if you can, the more you can dig it into the soil, six, eight, 10 inches in, the better off it is, because then it's gonna be right there at the roots to release all throughout the season. So the more you can dig it in, the better off it is, but even just sprinkled on top. If you've got planted plants, you can put it around it, you know, even kind of put like a little, you know, make a little hole and stick some in around like an established plant already as kind of like feeding it, you know. There's no way you can really go wrong. You pretty much can't put, I mean, you'd have to put inches and inches and inches of it on something before it become too much, so. Yes, compost tea is a great way to use it, and I actually use my worm castings for that. Um, there's a fancy way to com make compost tea, and then I'll tell you the easy way. The fancy way is to put this through an aeration system where it like bubbles through a system and it gets all this oxygen into it and it takes 24 hours and you use like an old fish tank, you know, vent, uh, filter system and all that. Then there's the easy way, which is what I do, which is I take like a bucket of water, a couple gallons, I take a couple good spoonfuls from my worm bin in it and I just get a big stick and I just stir it up really good uh, for about a minute or two till my arm starts hurting. I mean, that's generally the rule because really what you're trying to do is get the, the nutrients to bond with the water, water particles and then the water particles allow you to disperse it farther. So then I just literally pour it in my sprinkling can and I just go out and I put it over all my plants. That's how I use it. So there's the fancy way, but honestly then it's a lot easier. Now you can buy it. You can buy it at the farmer's markets and places like that. But honestly, you can make it yourself, particularly if you're making your own compost, okay? Now, let's talk about partially finished compost. 
Is that better than the compost? No, it's actually kind of similar. Um, it's basically just dispersing that nutrient to a wider base. So it kind of depends on what you're trying to do. So what I tend to do is I tend to plant my plants. I've already got compost in the soil, planted my plants so they're, they've got some there. But then a couple times in the spring when I'm trying to get them going, I'll do the compost tea. So the compost tea tends to kind of put less nutrients spread farther. So I want a more concentrated amount when I'm planting in the soil. So it kind of depends on what your goal is. Okay? So let's talk about partially finished compost. This is what you do when maybe you have just had one bin and you've got stuff that you've been adding two months ago that's finished and you've got stuff you added last week. And it's November and you're like, you know what? It's getting cold out. I'm done. <laughs> So what do you do? You have several options. First option, nothing. Put the lid on, walk away, leave it there. Nothing is gonna really happen much over the winter. You don't need to water it, you don't need to maintain it, but it's gonna pretty much all turn into that older pile kind of brown by the spring. Then in the spring, pull it out, mix it in with some fresh greens, a little bit of fresh browns, and start your pile over with our three inches, our three inches mixing and all that. You can do that, no reason you can't. One of the things I like to do in the fall is take that partially finished bin after I've cleared my garden, so I've just got my empty garden beds, I actually lay this partially finished compost on the garden beds. And you let the weathering kind of weather that in all season long, all winter long, and it'll help finish breaking down what's there. So that that finished compost is now sitting on top of your pile in the spring right where you need it, and you just work it into the soil, into those garden beds before your plant. So it's an easy way to deal with that partially finished pile. Um, so it's a way you can always pull it out and use it. You should never, though, use partially finished compost around anything that's not well established. So you don't want to put it on your new little plantings. Like if you planted your tomatoes, do not pull out partially finished compost and use it around those. Because as it's there, it will finish breaking down. And if there's new plants, it can actually rob them of nutrients instead of helping them. Whereas like your empty garden beds, it'll finish breaking down, but there's nothing growing in it. So it's a good time to do it. That's right, that's exactly right. So you don't wanna do it when there's fresh plants, but now, once you clear all those tomatoes and that dead plant material out of your garden, great time to lay down that partially finished compost. Okay, um, let's see. Let's talk about troubleshooting. Turn to the next page in your handouts. You can look at this later, but we'll just generally talk through a few things here. So generally, in Colorado, if your pile is not happy, Overwhelmingly, it needs moisture and greens. Your pile will tend to be dry. It'll almost never, ever be too wet. I mean, it'd be almost shocking to make it too wet in Colorado because things dry out so fast here that even if you try to over soak it within a day or two, it's gonna be drying again. So realize you pretty much can't make it too wet, but what can happen is it gets dry and what we need is the moisture so they can live there and the fresh green so they're attracted to come. So that tends to fix most of our problems. If your pile ever smells bad, that means it's breaking down anaerobically without oxygen. And remember, we want aerobically with oxygen. The anaerobic bacteria are the ones that give off the stinky smell. So if it ever smells bad, that's because it's breaking down without oxygen. Generally stir it. Make sure it's damp, and it should be good to go. It needs some oxygen usually. That's generally what fix most things, okay? The other reason about a bin, which they do mention here, is most people like bins because they look nice. You know, it's kind of, you know, compost will look kind of, you'll see when we open it, it kind of looks gross, you know? It's kind of stuff in there. But if, you know, so that's the other reason a bin kind of is helpful. It's much more attractive in your backyard, okay? Um, the back side of that page is some good overall um, websites. There's some variety of ones there. Um, they're all good ones. Um, the ones I would point you to, the top one, that's bouldercountyrecycles.net. That is a shortcut that'll take you to the county's um, resource conservation division site where they had info about these workshops, where they have all kinds of info about other waste reduction tips and things like that. 
Then the next two pages is actually this great little summary on how composting works. You can color that in later if you would like. And the next page is this fun little one about worm facts. It's just basically some kind of fun little tidbits and stuff about worms. So what didn't we talk about? What did you have questions on we didn't address? Mm-hmm. No. So you want to any so any plant in like that you want to shake off. I mean, you don't have to you don't have to strip it, but you want to shake off as much of that as you can because the soil is heavier and will actually weigh the pile down. The the dead plant material would be if it's dead, it'd be a brown. If it's still a green, and you're just tired of it, it'd be you know green. But the soil is the problem. Yeah. Um, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yep, that's correct. Like, make it look like tea, you know, like dark tea. You know, that's really what it is. So, um, yeah. What other questions? Yes. Can you get liquid composting in a box? Uh-huh. Is there a chemical kind of composting? It, it depends on what you're using it for. Um, honestly, if you're using it for a new planting, you could be a little heavier on the compost. If you're going to try to use it um, like a plant, you're going to put a plant in and it's going to be there for six months, I would probably do no more than 50% compost and the rest be top, as long as it's a good quality topsoil that'd be with it and stuff, because it needs enough of that soil for the structure so as the plant root structure grows, it's got enough support to allow, because that's really what allows that plant to go the bigger above the ground, is it's got to have a certain size root structure below it. And if it doesn't, if it's not strong enough to support a bigger root structure, it won't be, be able to get any bigger on the a top of the soil. Does that make sense? <coughs> okay. Yes? Absolutely. Yep. Anything, if you want to make it a brown, basically just let it lay out and it will. Yep. I mean, same is true even with your banana peel or whatever. I wouldn't encourage you doing that food waste. Yeah. But particularly for your leaves and your grass clippings or any of your garden waste or anything like that, absolutely. And usually, I mean, it'll, it'll literally change color. It'll be wrinkly for the few few days, but it'll still be a green. But at some point, it's going to start to become kind of crispy and brown. And that's when it's becoming a brown and not a green anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How big is your worm bin? Oh, Ooh. are they doing anything in the winter? Yeah, I doubt they're very active. So um, there's a reason. So actually, that's a great segue. Let's talk about worms. Anybody who would like to can come up and take a look. Um, anybody who's not interested in worms, you're welcome to go. Let me just make sure you know worms. This is what you do indoors. You don't typically do worm bins outdoors, particularly in Colorado. Um, so um, unless they're in a well-insulated item, and if you're just talking one of those stacking black trays or something, they're not going to, I'll be shocked. I mean, they'll probably survive the winter, but that's why nothing happens. They're meant to be in 50 to 70 degrees where you and I live. So that is your garage, um, and that is your basement if it's finished. But if it's an unfinished basement or unfinished garage, that is not that place in the winter. Mine literally sits on the hardwood floor in the family room right off the kitchen, so it's very convenient to go over with my cutting board and scrape stuff off into it. So... Um, that is why your worms are not very active. They're fine in the summer. They're not fine in the winter. You could do that and bring them inside. You do you inside your house? Yeah. Are you probably overfeeding them? Worm bins, um, even though worms can eat a lot, in a bin like this, there can be as many as 1,000 worms, which is about a pound of worms. Worms don't weigh a lot. That's the issue. So even though it's a pound of worms, if they eat half their body weight in food a day, that means you only can feed them half a pound of food a day, which is why that is like three apple cores. So if you're giving them all of your food waste, you're overfeeding them, which is why you have fruit flies. So, so anyways, I'm going to talk about worm bins. You're welcome to come up. We'll take a look at it. Anybody who is not interested is welcome to leave. If Bethany has compost bins, this one for 55 bucks, she has a couple with her. How many do you have? Three. She has three, and she can take cash or check only. She also has her card there. If you don't want to get one tonight and you figure out later you want one, you can contact her. Anytime we have stock, cattle, right. Right. 
Right. But, but you can't just plan to show up some random day at the recycling center and get one. You need to make arrangements with her ahead of time because she's not always there. Okay? So just so you know that. Anybody wants to know about worms, come on up. And the worm stuff I'm going to go through is what's in that orange brochure you have. The purple and green one you have is a good kind of um, overall of what we just talked about for the last couple hours. But come on up and we'll see my worm. And everything we talked about applies, which is why we do this at the very end. OK. So first of all, this is one I have built myself. But a lot of the same characteristics we talked about apply here. So what this is, is, is first of all, it has a tight-fitting lid. It is just a regular thing. I got it at McGuckin's. I think it's a 10-gallon thing. Um, yes, yes, 10 gallons. Notice it's opaque. You want it to be that you cannot see through it. They like a dark, moist environment to live in, which is why they also like bins like this. So this is do not get one of those clear, sterilite ones, OK? I just took my regular household drill, drilled a few holes right up here. That was it. Notice just a few ventilation holes, not too much. There is nothing on the bottom. It is a bottom, like there's a bottom. Unlike this guy, which is in direct contact with the ground, this is a closed system. That is so I can have it indoors, move it around, whatever I want to do, OK? Then unlike this, I actually filled it with newspaper first. The newspaper is the browns in this case. You do want to use shredded newspaper. Not everybody has newspaper these days, but get some of the free ones. You can also use leaves. I would not use anything else from a brown. So you really want something kind of more stable like that and nothing too weird, no twigs, no sticks, nothing like that. You want to fill it, and you want to make it damp as a wrung out sponge before you bef with the paper. So literally, when I first did this, I shredded a whole bunch of newspaper, filled the bin full, took a spray bottle, and sprayed it really good until it was damp as a wrung out sponge, OK? The whole, thing's full of newspaper? the whole thing at one time was full of newspaper. I've had this for a long time. But <laughs> that's how you're starting it from scratch, OK? Then the hard thing is you have to get the worms. Um, you do need to buy worms. This is not worms from a bait shop. Those are different kind of worms. You need red wigglers, which are the compost worm. Their whole job in life is to eat decomposing material. So you need to get them from somebody. There's a couple names on the back of your brochure. I personally recommend John Anderson. He's a little different. He lives <laughs> in Fort Collins. He's known as the Worm Man. He used to drive an old ambulance called the Wormulance. He has a handlebar mustache. And that's his home number on there. And you'll call, and it'll sound like, you know, hey, you reached John. Leave me a message. Let me know what you need, you know, kind of thing. And he's going to say, OK, you want a pound of worms. That's what he's going to give you. And it's going to sound a little weird. He's going to say, oh, I'll meet you in the, you're in Louisville. I'll meet you at the Target parking lot on Tuesday at 1 o'clock. And you're going to hand him 40 bucks. And he's going to hand you this, like, paper sack full of a whole bunch of worm castings, worm poop, worm compost, mixed with their bedding, and a whole bunch of worms, and juvenile worms, and little cocoons in it. And you're going to feel like it's a drug trade, and it's not, OK? <laughs> it's legit. He lives in Fort Collins. What he does is he does green building stuff, and he sells worms and worm composting. And um, he has these huge beds in his front yard. He does do them outside, but his are like massive sizes, and they're super insulated, and they have covers, and there's enough volume that they keep each other ambient temperature enough that they can survive. So what he's going to do is give you like a giant scoop out of those beds. Now, the problem is you can't just take that and go, on top of your pile. You have to pick out the worms. That's always the hard thing. So this is the work. You have kids. If you have kids or you know kids, they love this. You lay out a tarp, and you lay out the stuff on it, and you hand pick out the worms. Um, or you use the fact that worms don't like it out here. It's light, and it's bright, and they're going to get away from it as quickly as they can. So as you pull off a layer of that castings and stuff, they're going to burrow down farther onto the tarp. And you keep doing that till it's mostly worms left, or you hand pick them out. And you can't really hurt them. I mean, don't squish them in your hand, but you know, just throw them in your hand and then just throw them in. And they'll find their way down through the newspaper and stuff like that. Now, you do want to get all the worms in and give them a couple inches of what they had came in. Remember, they're used to living in those couple inches of the soil. So give them 
enough that there's about this much or so in this of the stuff that John's going to give you. Now, the great thing is you're going to have this bag left full of worm castings that you can then spread in your garden and use for other things or even throw a little bit in your compost pile if you want to try to get a little population going because mixed in with there is going to be things you won't see that are going to look like a grain of rice, which are the little cocoon the worms are in. So though you'll, it would help your population somewhere else if you were trying to do that. But just know it's valuable stuff or use it to make compost tea or whatever. But then um, you want to, you've now given them a couple inches. They're in here. You want to feed them a little bit of food waste. They only eat greens because remember this is, they're brown already. So we're not adding any browns to this. And really stick to kind of basic food stuff, fruits, vegetables, coffee grounds, tea bags, eggshells. Don't do anything too weird. They do not like some of the more extreme stuff, garlic, onions, herbs, um, citrus. Um, they won't like anything like that. And how you'll know is they will, wherever you put it, the worms are gonna kind of move as far away as they can. I've literally put a whole bunch of herb stems in one time, and when I went back like a week later, they were all on the lid, on the sides, <laughs> trying to get as far away as they could. Now, they didn't leave. Notice they didn't crawl out any holes because out here they breathe through their skin, which is covered in water, and it's dry, so they can't breathe out here. So they won't leave, but they're going to get as far away from something they don't like. And so they'll let you know if you put something in they don't like. I drowned mine. You drowned yours? Accidentally. I didn't put any extra water, but they drowned. What, and, that what, and that is what's going on in my bin right now. <laughs> it's a little extra moist. My worm bin tends to be a little extra moist. So what you do is you only put the damp newspaper in initially. Then they're going to eat that, and you're going to have to replenish it, but you replenish it by putting dry in to help soak up that extra moisture because this stuff we're adding in has moisture. Now, the nice thing is there's no turning. There's no watering. They do all that because they can move around. They go to the food. The only thing you have to be careful of, which I've been very bad about, is I let a lot of my castings sit in the bottom, and it kept compacting, compacting, and to the point that they didn't get very much oxygen. And I found that they were only living at the top layer because it was too dense. So I really mixed it up really good trying to introduce oxygen to back in, and now they're spreading out into the whole system a little bit better. But that's the way you also help deal with the extra moisture is put the dry newspaper in. So I actually put some dry in this afternoon, and as you can see, that's all that's left. So it does a really good job of soaking that up. If it gets really bad, you could always just take the lid off, open it up, and just let it dry out for an hour or two outside, and then cover it back up too. You, you could, it's gonna be a little more traumatic for them. Get something like this, this is better off, that's why I keep, and you know, as you can see, I just leave it right in there and stuff. And the nice thing is, is it won't, they can't eat it or anything, so it won't hurt them in any way. And then the great thing is, is then you just give them the same things. You give them little pieces, one to two inches in size. Um, you can't, you have to feed them a little lightly. If you overfeed them, then you'll have the fruit flies. The other trick about fruit flies is I found if you keep a layer of newspaper on top, the fruit flies won't go through the newspaper to the fruit to lay their eggs on. So we find that if we keep a layer of newspaper on top, this has been in my house for years and I don't have any fruit flies. I'll have fruit flies from the open bowl of tomatoes, but not from this, you know, and stuff. So that's what I find is if you don't make it easy. Yep, here's my uh, little plastic forks that I use for demonstration. Like that's how I got some out into my bin. <laughs> This morning. It, is from the soil that you can use, it produces compost, yep, it, exactly. You have to work around the worm. So a couple things. This is not the vine producer. This is the vine producer. This is going to fill up about this much in maybe six months. And then what you have to do is use the same advantage. What I do is I'll uncover one whole side, give them a few minutes. And by the way, so there's some of my worms. Um, and they're staying away. Yeah, they don't like the light, and that's what they're going to do. But see, there's some of the guys down there. And so what they will do um, is they're going to go away. So if I leave this exposed, they're all going to leave this area. And then I literally take a tablespoon and scoop some off, and then they burrow down farther. And I keep doing that till they're back to the one to two inches left, push the rest over to the other side, do the same on this side. So it does take a little work to empty it, but you only have to do it every six months or a year. And honestly, I don't even do it that often. <laughs> It's a combination of both. This is the primo stuff. This is the ultra nutrient dense stuff. Most compost tea, if you buy it commercially, is made from this stuff because this is the most dense. So um, 
this is the stuff I selectively choose. Like this is what I'll either make compost, tea, or if I've got something I'm really trying to help grow, I'll use the, this for because it doesn't produce near like this does. This is the stuff I'll dig in my soil. This is the stuff I'll use kind of around a few select plants or make into tea and spread around. Yep. So I apologize, but I know we're past time, so we have to keep moving. So I will stay and answer any questions. I can even go outside to do that because I don't want to hold them up too much. But if you have questions as I'm packing up, please don't be afraid to ask me. Thank you. Awesome. Oh, thank you. Great, great. Thank you so much. Yes.